You are listening to the Cognitive Preference Podcast, where we explore the fascinating ways in which our brains process information, make decisions, and perceive the world around us. My name is Robert Brown, and I'm here again with Francis Sopper, the originator of the Kairos Assessment, which is a series of questions that reveals how your brain prefers to think, listen, observe, move, read, and talk. You can take the assessment at kairoscognition.com to help you better follow along with the show. Uh, Today we are talking about paradox of choice. Enjoy. Researchers found that more people purchased jam when fewer options were available. Since then, other studies have supported this with subjects ranging from chocolates to 401k plans. Most have supported the notion that more options debilitate consumer decision making. Frank, of course, this concept has broad implications, but looking at this through the lens of behavioral economics, how does the paradox of choice relate to decision fatigue and cognitive overload? Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, We've talked about this in in other venues. So we're two of us are sitting here and we're attracting about 60 billion bits of information coming to us from our surroundings. And our poor little brains uh, can handle about 60 bits a second. So there's 60 billion bits of information out there. Our brains can optimally handle about 60 bits of information. Um, And so our brains have these mechanisms for uh, sorting and blocking information that's out there because we really function optimally under the influence of a very small amount of information. And one of the things that I go back to a number of years ago, um, I was in France and had the opportunity to visit a cave that had been inhabited by humans as documented as far as possibly 30,000 years ago. So people have survived at least two ice ages <laughs> in, the, in those wow. caves. And um, the people who lived in those caves were as human as we are. We, our brains haven't advanced in mm-hmm. 30,000 years. We've got the same brain. We have, if, there's, if there is evolution of the human brain, it takes longer than 30,000 years to evolve. So we've got this ancient brain. Now, these people with that brain, the same brain we have living in that cave had very little information they had to deal with. <laughs> um, Sounds optimal. Uh, well, uh, the, it probably wasn't in, in a lot of ways. And um, and one of the uh, moving things about it is they they had made art on the walls and um, they had made art representing hunts. They had made art uh, representing simple events. And one of the most moving to me was an outline of a hand on the wall. And it was a child's hand, a small hand. And I thought, I did that when I was in kindergarten. I made an outline of my hand. And my kids did that. And you probably did that. Mm -hmm. And your son will probably do that. Uh, Make that simple representation of themselves. Um, so that, um, simplicity, uh, is really what our, our brains are, are designed for. And now the level of complexity out there is phenomenal. I imagine our brains are struggling to keep up with everything that's in front of us. And, and it's hard to avoid in, in some in many cases. So are there specific cognitive preferences that make individuals more susceptible to the, the choice overload? We have 
seven processes, and and those of you who have been exposed to our work at Kairos Cognition know this. We have seven processes that do most of the work of uh, managing, capturing, distributing the information around us. And so, first of all, knowing these seven processes is helpful. So you can start to understand what will catch your attention, what will miss your attention, what will raise your energy, what will deplete your energy, just from a basic understanding of these seven cognitive preferences. But then we have various, within those seven preferences, we have various levels of responsiveness to information. And some of us have a, a very active level of response. Some of us have what we call a selective level of response. And then we have uh, every combination in between. And when we have selective responses, that actually means we're screening out more information. We're letting less information into uh, the hard shell here with the Chewy Center. Uh, and when um, we have an active response, we're bringing in more information. So both of them have advantages and disadvantages. Um, uh, the selective uh, keeps more information out, so can uh, keep information overload away, but it also can cause you to select for the wrong information. <laughs> right. Um, so of the I'm thinking back to the 60 billion bits of information that's kind of that's floating around. Our brain absorbs about 60 bits of that information. If you're selective, you're not taking in as many bits. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, at least in that category. So you may be very active in one category and selective in another. So it could average out. When we go out into the world, when we open up our phones, when we go into any kind of media, it's just <laughs> all the time. But and, I imagine that it's exacerbated if you're on the active side, and if you're because if you're picking up more bits of information, if you know if your attention is latching onto more things around you, then your brain is just going to deplete. It's going to get exhausted with now you have more decisions to or more information to evaluate to make the decision so i would think that the paradox of choice is going to hit active preference harder well which is why we have more people we have an epidemic of people describing themselves as attention deficit right and um and people's brains haven't changed um, there's not more people who might have a neurological condition of attention deficit. What I call it is attention surfeit, which is kind of a, a, a rhyme on deficit. Surfeit is an old fashioned word that means excess. We don't use it much anymore. But I feel like what people think is attention deficit is really attention surfeit. They have too much information coming at them. So it's not that they have any neurological deficit. They're experiencing information overwhelm. And yes, people who have highly active processors and the more the more the more of those seven you have that are in the active state are more likely to describe themselves as attention deficit. So uh, let's even though let's let's use the research example then. We're walking down a grocery aisle and you've got yeah. not just two boxes of cornflakes, you've got two aisles of boxes of cereal today. Yeah. Is the active preference going to struggle? You know, they're going to take in more information, so there's more choices to make. If I'm selective, I'm just going in and I'm walking out with a box pretty quickly? Uh, yeah, that would be very interesting uh, because it's very... Um, uh, the person who's selective preference, who's in a new market, so they don't know how the market, uh, they have, it's unfamiliar to them. So they don't know the rule and process of how to use uh -huh. that market. Um, 
that could be destabilizing to them because they don't know where the cereal is. If it's their familiar home market, um, then they go, they have their list and they go straight to aisle this for this one, aisle list for this one, aisle list for that one. Yeah, and they're not considering all of the possibilities. Uh, they'll get information overload when they're in an unfamiliar place and they don't know how to navigate it. And now they're trying to figure out, I just want you know, my honey nut Cheerios. I just want to get out of here. Yeah, and get out of here. And where are the honey nut Cheerios? What? Aldi's doesn't have honey nut Cheerios? Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. Um, so yeah, some that's a that's actually a strategy for handling that information overload is if you can walk in and know exactly what you want, what you want and where it is in that space, uh, then you're that's a strategy for it. But then if you're very active, you can even you can be sure that you want Honey Nut Cheerios and know exactly where they are. And um, then you walk in and you walk past the fruit and vegetable aisle and they have, uh, you know, beautiful raspberries for the first time this season. And uh, so you get attracted by those. And then you're going through the, the bread aisle and they're baking fresh bread and you get attracted by that. And then and and, you know, so on and so forth. As you're you're inundated through, by by all the choices you have. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, then it's like a fear of missing out too. You don't want to, yeah. you know, if you, and, especially and if you, it's on the shelf for a limited amount of time, you want to pick it up while you can. Right, and then you might uh, bump into a couple of neighbors along the way and have conversations, and then next thing you know, you're in the car and you have a bag full of groceries, and you get home, and uh, you know, someone at home says, "Where is where are the Honey Nut Cheerios?" <laughs> And, uh, oh, okay, that's what I went out for. Sounds like um, a familiar experience. Uh, it's for me, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I can't, uh, this is, a, I, I am noted for this. I can't go to the store for three things and reliably come back with three things unless I have a note. That's created all kinds of misunderstandings and conflicts because it uh, makes me look careless. Sure, when sure. I, um, so, uh, when I'm re actually highly conscientious, um, uh, but, uh, that quality can make me, uh, unreliable. What interventions can help make better decisions when faced with numerous, uh, options? Uh, when you had a couple of, uh, radio stations to choose from and, uh, three television stations, there was a limited amount of information uh, you could get. So the three broadcast news stations, even to when I was in college, uh, had 17 minutes of news a day. And, uh, and that had to be factual. So now when CNN, Ted Turner invented 24 hour news, uh, that seemed amazing because you could get actual reporters on the ground in the country in real time, see things as they happened. Um, now we have 100 sources who are doing all of that stuff. But it turns out there aren't that actually many factual things that happen every day. So now they have to tell you what's going to happen and um, what to think about what did happen. So you're not just getting here are the facts, you're getting here's what's coming and here's how you're supposed to think about what's coming and here's what just happened and here's how you're supposed to think about what's happened. So we don't have a presidential election Jeez. until the third week in November, but it's all day, every day in the news. And there's really nothing to say. We know who the candidates are. They both are transparent about uh, who they are and at least um, what they're proposing. You can find all, all about that in about, I don't know, 10 minutes, an hour of right. um, yeah. study. So anyway, um, the... 
the the easiest solution and the hardest solution is not to listen to anything that's first of all not actual news. Anybody who tells you how to think about something or what's going to happen is really full of it. Nobody we can't fix the past. Uh, we don't know the future. Um, anybody who's telling you authoritatively, this is what it is, this is what you should do, is almost certainly full of it. Uh, there's a small amount of information about what's actually going on. You've got a very useful brain to allow you, you to figure out what that is. And do you need to convince anybody else about um, to believe what you believe? Probably doesn't matter. Avoid information <laughs> as best Leo, you can. Run really as far as you can from modern society back to the Stone Age. <laughs> Pleasure speaking with you, Frank. Everybody that tuned into the show, thank you, and we look forward to uh, the next episode.